Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, idiot, and loin streamer. And today we're going to go over everything that I read in 2023, plus the video games that I played, because they're all part of the storytelling experience that I had last year. But <laughs> and you're going to see just the variety of things that I read. I'm going to go into what each of these books were. Um, maybe you'll find some books that you want to read. Maybe you'll be familiar with them because you saw me do reviews on them last year. Maybe you were wondering where they fall in the, the tier list of absolutely wonderful and torture device because that is what our um our scale is but before we get started number one if you enjoy what i do here on the channel please remember to like share and subscribe for more number two if you would like to be featured on the channel check out the links down in the description below the number one way to be featured is through lamwai the monthly prompt writing contest where i give you a prompt you write a short story using that prompt and the first monday video of the month we bask in the creativity of this community by reading a bunch of those it just depends on how many submissions there are and sometimes you know but we just did that on monday and it was um sparkly vampires so check out february's the second way to be featured is if you are an indie author and you have a book out or a book that is coming out if you submit your first chapter and your cover here if you submit your first chapter and your cover they'll be read here on the channel at a random interval to hopefully help more readers find your work because that is the bane of the uh, because that is the bane of everybody's existence as a creative, I swear. <laughs> Even when you're like, it's hard. <laughs> the third thing is, if you would like to check out any of my books, you know. The third thing is, if you would like to check out any of my books, they're available at any of your favorite places to get books, including the library upon request. I also accept hate mail in the form of emails, comments, bad book reviews that are just about me personally and Mashima merchandise sent straight to my P.O. box. Like, I will accept your forms of hate, <laughs> you know? With that, especially the last one. With that said, let's get into the book tier list. And I'm going to be doing these in the order in which I read them throughout the year, except for all of the video games, which are all the way at the end. And those are theoretically in the order in which I played them this year. So we have our seven sections of the tier list, okay? And so what we have here is Big Sleeve Energy, which is something that I really, really enjoyed. Like it was my taste. It was my style. I freaking loved it. Then you have You Are Spared. That's going to cover anywhere between like three stars and four stars for me because Big Sleeve Energy is like specifically, this is my jam. You Are Spared is like, you're fine and people will like you. If they like this genre, they will like you. And it was enjoyable. There were scenes that I liked. There were characters that I liked. Like You Are Spared. It's just not necessarily my jam specifically. And you know what my jam is, Model Land and Empress Teresa. So like take that as you will for my taste level. The next one is Wish You Were Here, and this tier was added because of a couple stories from the end of this year that I read, and you'll know when they come up, I'll tell you. But Wish You Were Here is the area for books that I'm like, you know what, I thought that that was bad, and then I read these other books, and um, I wish that I was here. Or like, I would prefer to be reading this rather than other things that I have been reading. The next tier is Dumpster Fire, which feels like it's self-explanatory. Just like the story was nonsense, the characters were nonsense. It was not a fun experience at all. Then we got Dumpster Fire and you are under arrest because um, not only was the story not fun, but uh, you violated some parts of societal agreements. Like, there is something wrong with you on a legal level, and you should probably be investigated for that. That's a joke. Uh, I don't actually think that these people need to be investigated. The third, <laughs> the next level is dumpster fire arrested and psych eval is imminent because what the frick. And so not only is your story a mess, not only have you violated the social contract, the societal contract, decency contracts, but also something is mentally wrong with you. You are deranged from having read like derangement shows in this story and so um you need to be evaluated okay uh and then the last one is literally a torture device in hell because there were some books that were actually that bad that they were just terrible okay and i will you'll know which ones they are and there are likely reviews on this channel specifically for those so you can go and see how i felt about those and what the stories are like specifically now that you know the tears, let's get into I know, they're very drastic. <laughs> so the first book that I read this year was Upright Women Wanted. Was it really Upright Women Wanted? 
So that was a Western, if you can't tell by the cover. Uh, and it was about some anarchist librarian lesbians <laughs> that were taking on society. And um, it was it was a novella. And I think it just came across my Goodreads board because somebody else had like reviewed it that was on my dash. And I was like, you know what? Okay, let's do it. Uh, I think it was a dumpster fire. <laughs> because... It was like the main character had run away from her home because her lesbian lover had been killed by her father. And then she she got into the caravan of the lesbian anar anarchy group um, that are the librarians that travel around and like slip books into places that they're not supposed to have. And they're on their way to Montana, which is where their con like the convoy, the group of them are. But it's like you run into... Was it Amity? Who was it that was, like, partway through there? <sighs> you run into, like, some outlaws later that know that they're wanted, and the main character finds out that the one of them is wanted for, like, assassination of a public figure. But then they walk, like, straight into this township that has the wanted posters out, and the chick is so proud of herself that she is at the front of the group, will not hide in the caravan, canopy like with the other ones so that they can just slip through unnoticed it's also because they know they have plot armor so they're not going to actually lose and die and so she just like leads them all in there and you also have another character in there who continuously reminds you that she's non-binary and you better freaking call her non-binary until you're actually talking to other people and then you call her she but and it's so uh, it, it it breaks the scenario it breaks it breaks the scene, it's unnecessary, and there is no actual, like, plot movement going on there. It kind of is all just convenient, so it's a dumpster fire. The next that we had was Breath of Creation, which was the second novel in the Christian YA romance space pirates thing, where there's the total totalitarian ship of the URS uh, on Earth, and then the space pirate guy in Sky. And this starts out with the girl that he was in love with got returned back to Earth because her dad is like the second in command of the totalitarian ship. And she theoretically went through the brainwashing process that is famous in the URS so that she would be a good soldier, a good member of society. But clearly, if you read the book, it doesn't really work. And then you kind of find out, oh, her dad is also a double agent. And basically, everybody is always undermining the totalitarian ship. It basically sort of felt like since the author is a Christian and she's writing for a very specific like group of readers, you can't have the bad guy, the good, you can't have the good guys do anything that would be considered bad because it would not be accepted by the readership. But the main good guy is also a space pirate. But it doesn't like lean fully into letting the bad guys be bad or the good guy be good and then contradict the bad guy. And it doesn't let you actually brainwash the female main character because she's not actually allowed. Anyway, there's a lot of conveniences in that. And uh, he also shouldn't have trusted the, the trade-off for that. A breath of Creation is going into Wish You Were Here because as I got further into the year, it was not actually that bad. And I have the mannequin uh, we read for the Loin stream, and it was submitted, uh, I mean, obviously, it was submitted by somebody who frequents the Loin stream, Ruth, because uh, <laughs> she wanted to share it with us. Uh, it was a novella, and it's about this group of friends that pick up this mannequin and then like Manny the mannequin and then like do some pranks with Manny the mannequin and then it seems like Manny the mannequin has be has come alive because he's moving on his own and as you go further in it's like the character had a psychotic break and then starts murdering people and uh yeah the ending was annoying it was unsatisfying so I'm putting that in dumpster fire because it was not really an enjoyable experience like it started out good it started out promising with a very strong character but just the ending was not satisfying in the least next you have guns and smoke which was a buddy read I did with Montana and um we did a review for guns and smoke on her channel if you want to check it out um and that is about Jesse and Bonnie. Bonnie is an outlaw, kind of on the run because she escaped sexual slavery specifically. And then one day at the very beginning of the book, she meets Jesse, who is a cowboy. He's got like his little brother who's eight, ten years old. And they're traveling to the south to go and be with their aunt and uncle after their house was destroyed in Montana. And look, we got another reference to Montana. Now I'm wondering if we should make Marcella from Montana. But that's a discussion for another time. Anyway, so they're on their way there when he gets uh, pickpocketed by Bonnie. She thinks that he is just the hottest thing that he is she has ever seen. And they end up 
with her saying that she will take him where he is trying to get because despite having gotten from Montana to Las Vegas all on his own, now he suddenly can't make it the rest of the way to Texas on his own and uh, needs her to guide him. So then they end up traveling and that means that he gets tied up in her business that has like Will Ellis involved, who's another outlaw, who's an assassin, who feels bad about what he does all the time. Even though Bonnie is a badass girl boss, killer bitch of everything but also the biggest victim and you got six gun involved six gun is hunting down bonnie to try to force her back into compliance of whatever anyway um dumpster fire arrested and if psych eval is imminent because <laughs> that book is so thirsty it is so thirsty and there is a 10 year old involved in this like i actually it's almost a literal torture device honestly i think it is it could be, if I read it again, I would probably say it's a literal torture device. It is so thirsty. Like, everything is just dripping with thirst. Jesse is hardly a character. He's basically a talking sex toy because he has no backbone. You have things like Six Gun shows up. So this is a guy who has physically and sexually abused Bonnie. And she's finally free of him. And she gets the upper hand on him in this train car and has a gun pointed at him. And instead of just emptying the barrel inside of him after he just beat the crap out of her, she just, like, shoots him in the leg and then pushes him out of the train. You know why? Because they needed a conflict at the end of the story when Six Gun shows up again but it makes no sense why she didn't kill him or at least shoot him in the head and then be like oh miraculously the bullet like bounced off a plate in his head and so he didn't die like do something like that but instead no it just made no sense to shoot him in the leg and then just push him off the train whatever the next is we have um the master and the marionette which is the second book after pawn and the puppet and this follows Skylena at, after the end of the first book, where she's in the treehouse with the male love interest. I don't remember what his name was, but I do know that the personality that was at the front of that was uh, Grayson, who was the sexual personality that formed after he was sexually abused as a child. Because, you know, of course, all of the trauma went onto that character. And this sort of devolves into a kink fic of sorts because they end up having a prophecy involved. They end up having to go to like dark elves in the woods where they live in like a circus tent style society where everybody has open sex out on the tables to prove who belongs to who. <sighs> and really, like whatever was in the first book is not actually in this book at all. I don't even think the main villain, not the main villain, but the guy that she was living with in the first book who had all of the money, he's not even in this. He's like referenced at the end of this book, but he's not in this book. In fact, it really felt like it was completely separate from what the first book was. So I'm going to put that in dumpster fire, arrested, and psych eval is imminent because the level, the number of times that a second book devolves into the author's kinks is ridiculous. Then we have Shadow of the Conqueror by Shad Brooks. That is a book about a tyrant who has killed millions of people. Was it 27 million people during his reign? And then, and then he raped 427 girls as young as 14. Um, and so then he decides it's the end of his life. He is tired of living. He says that he regrets everything that he did in life. I don't believe him because even at the be very beginning of the book, he tells us not to trust him by saying, oh yeah, so I feel bad about everything I did, except I'm going to leave lies about this other guy that I don't like because fuck him, so I don't actually feel that bad. So, like, you're telling me from the very beginning this character is not actually regretful or he wouldn't be trying to one-up his enemies even at the end of things. So, sorry I don't trust you, but I don't trust you. Anyway, so he goes to throw himself off the edge of the world because it is a flat floating planet thing don't ask me how the physics of that works don't ask me how they get rain don't ask me about the world building of that don't ask me where the water goes when it falls off the edge or if it hits like a border at the end don't ask me if animals walk off the edges of these floating planets like i don't know i don't know so he jumps off the edge of this floating land hoping to die holding these two stones because it would just be you know he wants to die in the most painful way and apparently the most painful way is not going into the nearest town admitting who he is and letting the people beat him until he is dead making him feel like shit about himself because they remind him of what a terrible person he was apparently that wasn't the worst way to die apparently the worst way to die is to just throw yourself off the side of the world in silence where nobody knows that you've done it Again, sorry, I don't believe you. Anyway, <laughs> so he jumps off the side of the world holding these two stones, and then he 
teleports basically back and he is young again. 17-year-old face, 30-year-old body, which is a very weird description, but I digress. And um, then he goes about saying, well, since I am alive, then the light, which is basically God of this world, wants me to survive and do something with my life since I basically got a do-over. So it's 17 again, but with a tyrant who killed millions and raped hundreds. So great for that. He likes to say that he is sorry, but throughout the story, he shows that he is not sorry and that when he is murdering people, he still thinks that he is better than everybody that he's murdering because he's doing it for the right reasons and he is holier than you so he can kill you and make that judgment on you. Uh, pretty much the whole thing is him just trying to get fake IDs so that he can live and uh, continuing to kill people with the exact same mindset that he had when he was alive, but then every so often he takes a moment to cry to the audience to say that he feels sorry, even though you see him making no changes in his life. Um, at the end of it, you do have a big court scene where he is tried for all of the things that he has done because his appearance has been revealed, and uh, you have a bunch of his rape victims show up, and some of them with the children, and he is talking about how they should be grateful because some of them have his children, and they seem happy to be mothers. And you also have one of the people that is continuously hunting Dalen down for the entirety of the story is uh, somebody that he raped when she was 14, and he did it so hard that she became infertile, and she fears sex and intimacy and nudity of all kinds. And at some point, Dalen has her in a bedroom as she's sobbing because he looks just like himself but younger, and he's pretending to be him, him, his own son. Um, but he tells her that his dad was not actually that bad when she says how she was affected by what Dalen did to her. So, like, you've got a lot of this. And then in the end, Dalen is just put on basically the police force, which can't control him because he's got OP powers. So that's that story. Um, a dumpster fire arrested and Psyche Val is imminent because honestly, as bad as that story was, it was not among the torture devices of this year, I don't think. Lace and Leather was one of those literal torture devices, and that's also because it was 600 pages, and you don't need freaking erotica that is 600 pages. I'm sorry, I do not see any point in erotica being 600 pages. Okay, so Lace and Leather, Leather and Lace, is the second book after Guns and Smoke, and it picks up where Guns and Smoke left off, sort of, because there's like a three-year time skip, which also is so stupid. Because at the end of Guns and Smoke, Bonnie is taken by Six Gun, or she, you know, gives herself up because she's hunted down by Six Gun, like I told you. She, he got kicked off the train, and then she was like, oh no, he's here to pick me up again. So then she just goes to spare everybody else of being murdered by him before he takes her. And so then she just randomly ends up in Louisiana, where she is now brainwashed and doesn't remember her past life. And after she disappeared, despite Jesse being like, I am a motherfucking outlaw. And like sounding like he was going to be proactive. Um, he didn't search for her at all when she got taken. He actually became an alcoholic for three years. And then all of a sudden at the beginning of this book, he's like, I gotta go save Bonnie. Meanwhile, Will Ellis was with Bonnie this whole time. Like, Jesse. And what also ends up happening in this book is that it feels like an, a an alternate universe version of these characters just to make... Bonnie a debutante and put her in this this situation uh, and to make Jesse into a cage fighter because that's what he has also been doing for the last three years. He's become a cage fighter named Montana. And then you have a second couple in this book that is Savannah, who is a house servant, and Will Ellis. And uh, Will Ellis is also bisexual. So for a little bit, he has a boyfriend named Sebastian whom he doesn't want anything to do with at first because Sebastian keeps having feelings for him and he's like no I can't be in a relationship I'm a bad person and then eventually he goes you know what Sebastian you believe in me and you think that I can be a better person let's try out this relationship thing and then he gets into that relationship with Sebastian and then immediately starts lusting after Savannah yeah um spoiler alert Sebastian becomes a bad guy. He dies, and then Savannah and uh, Will Ellis have sex on his grave. When Will Ellis had gone there to cry over Sebastian and kill himself because he felt so bad, and then Savannah shows up, and then they... Yeah. Yeah, it was a mess, and it was a bigger mess because it was 600 pages. It was infidelity. You also had infidelity with freaking Bonnie and Jesse because Bonnie was, like, 
making eyes at this one upper class society guy. And she was like going for it. And she was having a good time with that guy. And then she was falling for Jesse at the same time. So she was leading the other guy on. And then she actually said that she would marry the other guy after already having sex with Jesse and remembering who Jesse was. And oh my gosh, you get a look at Jesse's sketchbook. And he's got pictures of saucy Bonnie that he drew. Because he's an artist. Remember, randomly he's an artist. It doesn't come in anywhere except to be like, oh, I drew some nudie pics of Bonnie right next to the pictures of my kid brother. <laughs> Excuse me? Can you at least put them on different pages? Anyway, uh, um, so she already has sex with him and then she's still going to go forward with this wedding. But then she just like lights his house on fire and like blames him for their relationship when dude didn't even know anything better and he was just courting her. It was dumb so dumb just call it an alternate universe what actually could have happened in leather and lace is it shouldn't have been bonnie and jesse it should have been some completely other characters that maybe in book three could have met up with bonnie and jesse once they fled that household and then she would have had so, the authors would have had so much more freedom to do whatever they wanted there because they wouldn't have to make it cohesive with bonnie in the first book but like stuff in this book undermine stuff that happened in the first book the only thing that this book has over guns and smoke is that harry the child is not in it so with all the thirsty adults going around harry is not subjected to it because that was bizarre it was a bizarre choice to have a main to have a child in the main group of a thirsty book and then at some point it just feels like Harry is there as a tool to try to make Bonnie look better because in a lot of cases there is a shortcut for how to make a bad guy look better just introduce a child and give them a chance to take care of that child and then it'll be better they'll look like a better person by virtue of taking care of that child whatever so then the next book was Light Lark which was a book that we read for Loin Stream I also read it last year but you know we've got the hardcore Light Lark fans in the Loin Stream you know who you are <laughs> and um that is about Isla, who is the queen of the wildlings, and she doesn't have any powers. The wildlings are the plant-based creature society in this society of, like, the skylings, the moonlings, the starlings, the sunlings, and nightshade. And then you've got the wildlings. And... Um, there's going to be the Centennial, which is this battle free-for-all thing where all of the kings and queens of these different realms get together, and they're trying to solve this prophecy so that to lift the curses from each of the realms, and um, that's pretty much where it stops making sense because it's not a tournament at all. <laughs> but the thing that bothered me the most about this book was that Isla was an OP psychotic murderess um but she pretended that there was no effect on it uh but after also having read nightbane it makes even more sense because she is actually a murderess like she is actually a bad guy so you know what upon reading further things this year i hated light lark last year but number one when you read it on the loin stream it gets so much more fun than reading stuff on your own number two uh it wasn't that bad i have read some worse things this year and um Light Lark wasn't that bad. Look, the one thing that I want to warn authors about is be careful <laughs> about your story building because you do not want to be the book that uh, creates a new tier that says, I was wishing I was reading a different book. They're like a book that I thought was bad. I would like to go back to an earlier time when I was innocent and not reading this. Oh, we'll get there. So the next book that we read was Battle Games, which was also a Lauren Stream read, Battle Games by Alex Ratcliffe, and it is basically like a sports shonen anime, but in book form, where there is like this massive sports league type thing, and a bunch of teams internationally compete, and it's like extreme sports, physical sports, sometimes with murder, and uh, Frankie, the lead of the main sports team, opens up by getting injured, and so then he has to be out of out of the ring the whole time so then they bring in this new guy Gus and <laughs> Gus <laughs> and so then you kind of go mostly from one battle to the next to the next with a little bit of interpersonal stuff throughout some things like people getting in relationships they shouldn't be in Harpy struggling Harpy the the lead female character struggling to be the leader that she needs to be because she's kind of really abusive to the team and so battle games would go in you are spared uh, because it wasn't my thing but if you do like the 
the shonen anime that mostly focuses on these games it felt more like a visual thing definitely for me than it than being served in a uh, literary format um, but if you like that sort of thing, then you may like it. The next one was Beyond Magenta. So one thing that I did this year, and if you've been around the channel, then you may know, is that I started reading the 2021 and 2022 banned books list that were put out by the American Library Association. And that's because over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk about like book bannings and this screaming of like illegitimate book bannings. And so then I wanted to get my hands on the books specifically that they're touting as like being unfairly banned and see what those books are for myself. And so I started reading them. You can find all of the book reviews for those books on this channel if you're interested in what those books actually were. And so all of those are in this list from 2021 to 2022. Keep in... Uh, I'll keep you posted because I will be doing 2023 when it comes out later this year. And uh, so Beyond Magenta was number 10 on the 2021 list. And Beyond Magenta is six stories, uh, memoirs basically, sort of, not really, but sort of, of six transgender people saying their story of like why they transitioned, what influenced them, who they were, what their life story was, and it's all teenagers. Um, so I think some of them were like 14 when they did it. And the biggest problem with it is, is because they're teenagers, one, they're still developing their sense of identity. Two, one of them is very clearly heavily abused, and she has bigger issues than what is explored in this book. Like, she needs psychiatric help is what she needs. Because uh, we're talking about, like, raped as a child, raped during um, being in foster care, like, raped while being in the hospital for psychiatric issues, physically abusive and uh, violent. So, like, she's got some issues, but, oh, that go far beyond the scope of this book. But because they're all teenagers, or were teenagers at the time of doing this book, then they're all also going to be scared of being completely honest and being judged by their peers, because you're not going to want to be put in that situation where your peers are going to be able to read your innermost thoughts. So, it's... It's a very awkward and also it felt predatory to me. And also the story was mostly, and also when the author was like asking, hey, why did you do this? In most cases, they were like, well, you're just going to have to believe me because I don't want to share that reason. And the whole reason of doing a memoir is to let people in to know why you did the things the way you did to give better understanding. And in this situation, I don't think the narrator or the journalist or whoever, however you want to call them, did a very good job at interviewing these people and pushing for what needed to be said in order for people outside of the ring to understand. But I also understand that these are teenagers and you're kind of putting a lot of pressure on teenagers who want to be accepted by their peers. So it was just like, dumpster fire and you're under arrest because really i think that it's predatory to, to use children like this and to profitize off children and to put children in that situation like they do not know better so sorry but as a 14 year old trying to figure out who you are and changing your haircut six times in the summer and then deciding that you're gender fuck like you're figuring yourself out and that's okay <laughs> But you don't need a book written about you while you're trying to figure yourself out and you think that you're special because in kindergarten you were the only kid coloring in the lines and reading fantasy novels and you were correcting all of your peers and you also think that everyone else talking about sex is stupid because you were talking about smarter things like oh my gosh there was a lot of not like other girls syndrome in there as well anyway um the next book is This Book is Gay, which was also on the banned books list. And this is a nonfiction book that describes itself as a manual for being gay. And it talks about, in grave detail, sexual encounters, how to use Grindr. It also goes into different places that are against homosexuality, where it's dangerous to vacation in sexuality. It has a very weird narrative style to it, where it feels like it's talking down to you like you're eight years old. So it feels really insulting, but it's got a section and they're also telling parents what to do at the end, which also feels condescending. So the narrative writing is very young, but it says that it's geared towards 14 to like 18 year olds, but 14 to 18 year olds, I don't feel like you're going to respond to the way that this book is written because of the tone of voice. Anyway, um, dumpster fire, you're under arrest and psych value is imminent because what the frick? 
because that is 100% a predatory book. It does a lot in the narration to say that it is trying to alienate the readers to make the readers feel like they are alone. It's like, if you're a little bit weird, if you're a little bit quirky, then believe me, believe what I'm about to tell you. You can either be friends with us or you can live alone. And then, you know, uh, heavy detailed descriptions on douching, on having anal sex, on, and this is for children. So <laughs> definitely under arrest. Mm, we need to figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish with this book. So Psyche Val, A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass is also on the list. And I buddy read that with, I think it was Hal. I read that in solidarity with Hal <laughs> earlier this year. Uh, that is about Feyre, who is a human girl. And one day while she is in the woods, she shoots a wolf, like a giant magnificent wolf that she thinks is a fae because she freaking hates fae. And so then Tamlin, a fae king of the whatever court he's in, comes into her house and he's like, who killed my friend? And then he abducts her because he she owes him her life for killing his friend. And so he's like, I'm going to freaking marry you because actually he's under a curse that if he doesn't marry a human, have a human fall in love with him who absolutely hates his kind with malice uh, before 50 years is up, then he has to give like all of his powers and his kingdom over to this bad girl named Amarantha. And so... Uh, that doesn't go very great because Feyre is very selfish in that she won't say that she is, but she is. She pretends that she's not, but you know, you re read between the lines. She is one of the most insufferable. She is worse than Isla, let's be real. Um, and so then the time runs out and she is not in love with Tamlin. So he sends her back to the human realm and then she comes back to the fairy realm and chases him to the under the mountain where Amarantha is keeping all of the fae and then like beats this three-tier system of three-round system of things to uh get the phase freedom and um yeah dumpster fire and you're under arrest because uh, it was very nonsensical the second the last third of it didn't make any sense compared to the first third and uh Feyre is Yeah, Guns and Smoke was worse. Yeah, Feyre is... <laughs> a Court of Mist and Fury picks up after uh, A Court of Thorns and Roses. And, I mean, already that just goes in a freaking literal torture device because it's like fan fiction of itself. And the author decided that she hated Tamlin, so she's going to character assassinate Tamlin and gaslight everybody in the book and the reader to pretend the events of book one didn't happen the way that we saw them happen so that she can frame Tamlin as the bad guy and spend so much time with all of her characters just sitting in a kumbaya circle, trauma dumping on one another to get your sympathies. And she goes shopping again and again and again. And it falls for the issue of the second book in the series turning into a freaking kink fest where again we have a public sex situation where she goes to the nightmare court with Rysand who is her new bae and he like fingers her in front of everybody because that's what you gotta do because she is now a slave to him to prove that he's got power over his realm or whatever and it's really just an excuse to finger her in public and um yeah it it's mostly fanfic it's way too long I think the books continue to get long and uh it just turns Tamlin in to the bad guy while Rysand is turned into this great guy and you got the freaking introduction of wing play going on in here and it's more sexual and it just picks up more sexual it's, it's very different from the first book so literal torture device because also it's too dang freaking long like some people you don't need more books and it's not because of attention span issues it's because you're wasting my time with this garbage that contributes nothing to the story you're just basking in how much you love your characters I'm glad you love your characters but that's not a story Next, we have The Bluest Eye, which I'm going to put in Dumpster Fire, Arrested, and Psyche Val is imminent. So The Bluest Eye is an examination. Is an examination of a neighborhood. It's like a poor neighborhood, and it follows a bunch of different characters that you're getting different perspectives on how these people operate and see each other in the neighborhood. And it's specifically like a black neighborhood and how they see the world how they see society how they look at this girl piccola who's from this very dysfunctional family her father rapes her when she's nine years old and uh, gets her pregnant and everybody in the area kind of 
likes keeping Piccola around because it makes them feel better about their lives. Meanwhile, other things that you've got in the story are like, here's an entire perspective setting up Piccola's dad right before he rapes her so that you can pretend it justifies anything. You've got this other situation where this woman mar married a white man so that she could get out of this other neighborhood and everybody's judging her for pretending that she can be anything but that than what she is and her son is a psychopath who like tricks this other girl into his house and then like starts beating her and she's trying to like see the cat that's in the house and is running around the house to look for the cat and then he gets mad that the cat's getting the attention he's not getting so he beats the cat to death and then throws the cat into the little girl's hands and then blames her for the death of the cat and the mom believes her son because she wants to believe her son is better than this little black girl so very much about racism and um you've also got an entire chapter from a pedophile's perspective saying how it's god's fault that he ignores the children and that he does more for the children than god ever did and um yeah i don't know why people don't really talk about some of the issues in this book that if they say that this is a good representation of that sort of neighborhood and like it is important to see what exactly are you saying because these are a lot of terrible people and are you saying like these are problems that a bunch of people are facing and if so why are we not discussing those problems because it doesn't seem like this book actually comes up to talk about the severe issues inside of the book the next one is Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, which is kind of an anti-John Green style book. And if you know John Green, don't know John Green. He's like the fault in our stars, kind of doing uh, medical inspiration style stories. And Me and the Earl, Me and Earl and the Dying Girl is about a self-centered high school kid who finds out that some girl he dated in middle school suddenly has cancer. And so his mom guilts him into becoming her friend before she dies. And uh, he doesn't want to spend time with her. He feels like it's a waste of his time. And by the time you get to when she dies, he's like, yeah, you know, my friend Earl was a better friend to her and like liked her more than I did. And I didn't gleam anything off of being a friend. And like it was totally useless and worthless and I didn't learn anything. And uh, that's pretty much the end of it. It's it felt like a waste of time to read. The writing was poor. It felt like it was trying to be written like a movie script. The author didn't really care about it. So a uh, dumpster fire and you're under arrest because uh, you violated the laws of writing a book to be at least entertaining. Tokyo Vice is a nonfiction about a man, a journalist who goes to, who went to Japan in the 1990s and 2000s to investigate the Yakuza in Tokyo and um, all around that area. It is a memoir. It goes into big sleeve energy because I did enjoy it quite a bit. It had a lot of helpful information, a lot of interesting information about the culture at the time and about what he was doing. I did think that it was short on some information that he either cut out for personal safety or for whatever, but I do think it skipped over some important information and we jumped kind of from one place to another. But the cultural information on it is good and the insight that he brings is great. The next one is Brett Easton's Ellis's The Shards, which came out earlier this year. And I'm going to put that in big sleeve energy, even though I think that one could have suffered from being a little long and kind of meandering a bit. Um, but Brett Easton Ellis's The Shards is inspired partially by his life, partially by mystery and there was something else but it is partially autobiographical in fact it is also the main character of that book is named brett easton ellis and i think it does take events from his life but it also mixes some ideas of murder and some news events that were happening at the time and he kind of merges them all together to create this new experience and then i tried to read it at the beginning of 2023 but uh I struggled to get started. I put it down and then picked it back up. And it wasn't until after the statue uh, description introduction that it really started to pick up. But then really it was the last third of the book that made me happy that I read it because the rest of it, it's a great character study. And Brett Easton Ellis is fantastic at character description, at showing character personality, at showing these yuppies. But it didn't pick up the intrigue until the end, until closer to the end it was really just his interactions with people in the yuppie culture and trying to get further ahead in the movie industry doing favors going to school how he was awkward with his girlfriend because he was still in the closet so it it's like a six seven hundred page book that i think it meandered a bit uh it was a bit slow at times um so it was harder to start but 
Overall, it was enjoyable because it was Brett Easton Ellis. Ellis' style, and I like the way that he writes. So the next one is The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexi. And I put that in You Are Spared because the voice of it is good. The humor is good. I thought that it was age-appropriate. That was another book from the Band of Books list. And it is about a teenage boy who lives on a reservation in the United States. And he petitions or fights with his parents or whatever to go to a school outside of the reservation where the white kids are. And from there, he actually integrates very well with the other, with his classmates. He starts doing basketball. He starts feeling motivated. And then you've got kind of this comparison of the outside world and the inside world. And how he sort of feels like if you stay on the reservation, then you're wasting your life and you're going to die on the reservation. But it can also be scary to leave and you can get in trouble with your peers if you leave because they feel like it's a betrayal. So it's a very good examination of the problems that come up in that society. Then you have Zenith, which was another Loinstream read. It is by two YouTubers. I can't remember their names. And it is about a group of space chicks that do jobs like space mercenaries. And they get chased down by the captain's boyfriend who is sent on a job to find her before they then get hired by the king on the one planet where the girl used to be a private guard for the king's daughter. But then, you know, she kind of went into a, uh, a plane ride for a joy ride with the daughter for one birthday and crash landed and the daughter died and she felt bad and she ran away. And uh, there are a lot of flashbacks. This book actually has two plot lines going on at the same time. One of them is like the previous generation while you've also got the current generation. And so it keeps flip-flopping between those. But then you've also got like a bunch of perspectives that you don't really need. So it went really, really slow. And I'm going to put that in dumpster fire because it like, it was hard to follow because there were so many perspectives going on and it just felt so slow. The next book that I read was also for the ALA's banned books list and that was The Hate That You Give. It is a book about a, a black girl who went to a party and when she left the party, she left with a childhood friend of hers. They got pulled over by the police and during this pullover, the friend got shot by the cops. This then leads into some civil unrest and some riots in the neighborhood. Um... I'm going to put this under, I think it's a dumpster fire more than anything, because like it jumped around in places and it felt like a not completely thought up idea in that it didn't fully develop what was happening in the story. And in ways it kind of re re relied on you to be following the news, to fill in the blanks between events, between chapters, because it wouldn't explain things. It's like in one chapter, everything is fine. And in the next chapter, like the entire bl city block is under lockdown because of riots happening outside where you have no explanation for where those riots came from. And it was published like in 2016, 2017, something like that, where the Black Lives Matter group was becoming more prominent and there were issues in certain places. And instead of actually just describing and building everything contained within the story, it's like you needed to pay attention to the news to then connect the events of the news into the story. And one that feels smarmy to me and trying to create that emotional connection between the readers and the book so that they go, oh, real life, the book is filling in the things we didn't see. Mm, no, make it self-contained. Um, and then that also ends up feeling lazy. The second thing is that it says that the police are the issue because of institutionalized racism causing these things, but the actual antagonist of the story is a drug dealer, gang member leader in her neighborhood that they then use the police to arrest so that he's off the streets and not controlling everybody again. So, but it, then it still tries to say that the police are the problem, so I don't freaking know. The next book was Nothing But Blackened Teeth. This is a horror novella. Um about a couple of yuppies that go to Japan to have a wedding, all paid for by Philip because Philip's a nice guy, but he's a rich white guy. So of course he dies. Um, sorry, spoiler alert, he dies. The whole thing is set up to have everybody be jackasses and Philip is actually not the worst of them, but because he's a white guy and a rich white guy at that, he is the one to freaking kill him. So dumpster fire and you're under arrest because it was trying to also be like, I'm not like other horror books. I'm an MFA student. I use creative descriptions. Using super creative descriptions does not, does not help you if you're bad. Tower of Dogs is going to go into You Are Spared because it's a good YA fantasy book that is very much a uh, that very much feels like an anime. It's got some slice of life going on in it, and it's about a brother and sister, Sparrow and Rome, as they are trying to escape from where they currently live into a place that is more safe. 
because of bad things that are coming to where they live and they actually get separated because sparrow gets on the train and rome doesn't get on the train and so then she ends up in eden Edon, uh where it's a walled city with like rich people and then rome is still in the forest and um, the story is them trying to find each other again it takes place over a couple of years and there is some level of slice of life there as rome settles in with his brothers in the forest and he, and um and sparrow is settling in as a servant to a girl named jenny in the city <laughs> the next book was out of darkness which was another book from the ala's band of books list that's going in freaking literal torture device and is about a mexican girl who moves into texas with her mom who just remarried a white guy and all of the racism that she faces and then she falls in love with this black guy named wash and they face more racism and um it's basically just misery porn where she is raped by her dad at the end where she and her boyfriend are both killed when they're trying to leave and um his sister her, her sister dies in a bombing on the school that everyone is blaming on the black people in town and um it's worse because the author goes around saying this is necessary for historical relevance, but then also says I took this historical event and uh, changed everything about the response to it and what happened and why it happened, but we need to teach this like it's history. The next one is All Boys Aren't Blue, which is a memoir from the ALA. It's going into dumpster fire, arrested, and psyche eval is imminent because what the frick? Partially because he was molested by his cousin when he was eight or nine years old, and uh, I think you probably need to be evaluated for that especially when you got angrier at a white kid saying rap lyrics at graduation than you did about your cousin uh molesting you as a child so all boys aren't blue is a memoir that covers george's life here and there and he pretends that he was uh, oppressed but his grandma took him to disneyland and took him to different places every summer and he had both of his parents they owned their own house their grandma owned their own house and he just does like normal things but then acts like he is some beacon of we should all listen and do what his family does and he really has a savior complex in this story it's just it's a normal guy that wants to be more than a normal guy is what it felt like it was boring that was all boys aren't blue doesn't even challenge the idea of gender stereotypes because it just conforms to them because he talks about things that he likes in like chapter one or two and he goes well other boys don't like this and since i like these things i must not be a boy you can play jump rope and be a boy like you can wear cowboy boots that are flashy and be a boy like oh my gosh and so then the title one of the things about the title is that it never actually brings up like talks about his parents are both cops and it never talks about that but then it makes a comment about it at the end of the book and is in his closing statement and there is so much that could have been done here to draw parallels or to evaluate things but instead his book is full of lies which includes him saying that he made up words and popularized words in his class that are clearly traceable back to even the 1960s uh so you can't trust anything in this book because by book by the second story he proves that he's a liar so it's dumb to even call it a memoir because it's just full of lies the next book is a comic book from the ALA, and it was Flamer, uh, Dumpster Fire, Arrested, and Psyche Val Imminent because of having middle schoolers jack off into a bottle of Mountain Dew and then say they have to drink it. The book is about a middle schooler about to enter high school, going away to his last summer camp before high school, and he is excited because he's hoping that it is less judgmental than middle school. Good luck. It's also because he's going from a private Catholic school into a public school because he thinks that it's going to be less judgmental and he will be bullied less for being gay. Uh, if it was rated for a movie, it would be rated R, but somehow it is in grade schools. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of questionable content in there. The next one is Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison. This was another book from the ALA's reading list and it goes into a literal torture device because uh, the main character of that book is insufferable it is about mike who is a lawnmower by trade he is like 20 something and uh, he decides that he doesn't want to listen to his boss anymore so then he is just obstinate until he gets fired and then he goes from job to job really not getting any jobs because he's applying for stuff he doesn't have skills for and then blames capitalism as the problem that he's not getting any job because it's supposed to mean opportunity for everyone right and so then he kind of just goes from protest to protest he's talking about mention talking about this girl at the diner that he kind of likes but then in the last like 
10% of the book, he decides that he's gay. And he also continuously mentions how he sucked this one guy's dick when he was seven years old and the other guy was also seven years old. And he uses that to try to manipulate the other guy into doing everything that he wants him to do because he feels like he can out him as a controlling mechanism. I don't know. I don't freaking know. But yeah, it was terrible. The next one is Marked, which is about a girl who discovers that she has been marked as a vampire. We read this for the loin stream. It is like circa 2010, if you look at the cover. It's just a dumpster fire. It's just like witches in a witch boarding school. And they're calling them vampires because that's what was popular at the time. But they are clearly all witches. The next one is Gender Queer, which was a comic book, a, a memoir. That's about a person kind of going through their self-discovery of how they are gender non-conforming and... Um, a dumpster fire arrested and psyche vow imminent because really it looks like the person was neglected by their parents and they need some attention she because it talks about this person not getting not knowing how to read until they were like 11 or 12 and the person was obsessed with gay fan fiction in college and just it doesn't need to be in schools that's for sure but uh yeah the next one is Supermarket. <laughs> Let's go dumpster. Actually, you are here. Supermarket by Bobby Hall. He's also a YouTuber. And this is about a character who decides to get a job at a supermarket because he's trying to write a book and he has no ideas for the book. So he's going to get a job at the supermarket to give him ideas on what to write about the book. He also immediately, like, before he even gets started on the book, he somehow gets the attention of some bigwig in New York who flies him out to New York and then has him sign a deal to write the book before he's even written the book. And so then he goes back and he's like, well, now I got to write this book. So he gets the job. He meets this crazy guy, Frank. And we got some level of fight club in here where uh, later we find out that Frank isn't real. Frank is a uh, alter ego of this character. And this character is actually a maniac. Uh, but it's it's wild. Uh, but it was entertaining. The next one is Crank, which is the first in a trilogy of stories written by the mother of somebody who died of an overdose. And it's kind of her love letter love letter her warning letter to teenagers to not do drugs it's kind of narcissistic because when it mentions the mother it constantly compliments the mother and then like insults the dad so you know that marriage didn't that that marriage didn't end well i'm gonna put that in dumpster fire because it's also actually it should also go into under arrest because it's a freaking poetry <laughs> Next one is Looking for Alaska by John Green. This was also an ALA book list. I'm going to put that in dumpster fire because there's really no actual story going on in there. What it is is about this kind of... <laughs> Most of these books that are YA that have a male main character, it's just like they don't care about anything, which feels pretty par of the course of that age group. And so then he goes to this private not private school this boarding school off in another state because he wants to get away from his family in florida and just go have experiences of his own and th then he meets this cool girl named alaska where she is like the edgy queen you know she's got stuff like you smoke cigarettes for fun i smoke them to die like that sort of thing and so there's the countdown from the beginning of when he got to the school to the day that alaska died in a car accident to then the fallout after the car accident to how everybody is responding there's the main character trying to discover why alaska died he's upset because he was going to have sex with alaska but then she like left to go see her boyfriend instead and so he never got to have sex with her and so he's kind of obsessed with like what happened to her i wanted to have sex with her and then i didn't get to have sex with her like it's it's a whole thing <laughs> And then at the end of it, they do some prank that was uh, Alaska's prank because they want to do a tribute to her. And it was like calling in a male stripper to come during an assembly and like strip in front of all of the class. And it was just. There was no plot. OK, it was just like snapshot scene from scene from scene. The next is Lucky Red, which was another contemporary Western, contemporarily written Western, about a girl who, her dad is kind of not good with money and not good at making decisions of any kind. And um, one day he comes back and he sold their house. So he's like, we got to move. We got to go somewhere else. So her and her dad start traveling. And uh, one night they go and hide in this little house and her dad gets bit by a snake and he dies. And so then she just takes everything that he's got on him and then continue and 
doesn't even really bury him because she freaking hated him and then continues on until she reaches dodge city where she buys a hotel room and she just eats for a couple of days spending all of her money before she goes and gets a job and then uh, she doesn't like the job so she talks back to the lady gets fired and then she gets picked up by a madame and then gets taken into a brothel and then becomes a prostitute and then it's her being a prostitute until halfway through the story the gunslinger spartan comes in and um shenanigans yeah yeah spartan is a lie <laughs> that's all you need to know spartan is a lie this is dumpster fire and you're under arrest because freaking just tell a cohesive story please i wish the story had actually described the character doing anything but it was so detached from its own narrative that it was so boring and then so then they're like you need to listen to the way that it tells you how about you actually show me the characters doing stuff the next one was people who eat darkness i'm gonna put that in you are spared that is a true crime slash like courtroom story uh much more courtroom because it goes through the case of one criminal in japan i don't remember what his name is off the top of my head but he was known for picking girls up from the hostess clubs during dohans, which is like one-on-one -on -one dates where you take them outside of the hostess clubs, and you would drug them and then have sex with them, rape them, and then lie to them about what happened and then set them free again. He had like hundreds of videotapes of him raping these women. And then um, people started getting onto him about it because there were like two gaijin who were picked up by him and then murdered and then disappeared. And there was this great effort from a couple of people from the UK looking for their daughters, which eventually led to discovering exactly what he did and all of his videotapes. And uh, yeah, a lot of it is less focused on the killer himself and more about the culture in Japan, especially with Koreans because he's actually Korean and he changed his name so that he fit in more with the Japanese. And so you've got a lot of background information and historical information about the create Koreans and about how he related to society, what society thought about him. And then the search party, because you've got much more of the perspective of like the dads looking for their missing daughters and the courtroom and the trials. It's actually in this book that I learned that this this trial took like seven years because they only have a court date once every month because of the the trials are so rare. And so you get some interesting background information and cultural information through that story. The next one was a the perks of being a wallflower uh, dumpster fire. <laughs> Freaking, I'm trying to think because it had some good moments, but for the most part, like it's not what I was expecting. That was another book from the ALA's banned book list. And it is about a kid named Charlie. Actually, actually, you know what? The ending makes this you're freaking under arrest. We're changing that. Should, actually, should I? Nope, that just dropped real fast. You know, it's the ending. The ending did that. Because otherwise, I could probably just be like, you know what? This is a sketchy book. I don't know why they're obsessed with freaking Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, especially because they're all like, Charlie is 15. And they're like, hey, Charlie, why don't you come up on stage and gyrate your hips and all these other people in underwear? You're going to make a 15-year-old play Rocky for Rocky Horror Picture Show? Or Y'all are really sketchy. <laughs> you got freaking nothing over here taking freaking 15-year-old to all of these gay hookup spots and then having him be hit on by these other people and getting him drunk and hitting on him every night to what? What are you doing? What are you doing, nothing? Um, but so that's about Charlie, who seems kind of mentally inept. He doesn't seem totally there. Uh, and he's kind of simple. And... Um, you kind of just get his floating through life and how he associates with people, how he is around people. He's kind of very watchy, which is where the wallflower comes in, is everywhere he goes, he's just sort of watching, just sort of floating. And um, eventually at the end of it, the sister to nothing is like hitting on him and asking him what he wants. And he doesn't know what he wants because he never really participates. And it's also at the very ending of the book where it like randomly throws it in your, throws it in that he was like sexually molested by his aunt 
but there's like nothing in any of the rest of the story of it being like that and he's super freaked out when the one chick is about to have sex with him and that's the reason why he won't have sex with her but earlier in the story he has sex with a different chick and doesn't freak out so then it's like did he completely forget that he had sex with the other chick because he didn't seem to be to be minded with her but now with this one it's like oh no i can't do that because i have this response and i don't know why i have this response it did and it didn't differentiate like what would be the trigger between this chick that he actually likes versus that chick who he was dating for a little while and it just threw it in there at some point it just felt like it was trying to like throw on as much baggage as it possibly could because you had abortion and abuse and sexual abuse and like bad family dynamics and all of this stuff in there and it was just like it was not good the next one is, is Slay, which is about a teenage girl who created a massive online RPG that uh, services like half a million people. And she did this when she was 15 all by herself and with donation art only. And uh, she pays for the servers herself. And they're at a university in France. And uh, the thing about the video game is that nobody but black people can access it and you have to use a special phrase code that is only passed around person to person and nobody but black people have ever gotten that. So then one day some troll shows up on there and then starts being super racist and dressing his avatar as a racist in different ways and uh, is ruining the vibe. And so then she she thinks that she's going to get sued for discrimination if she kicks him off. So then she's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. It's also like Yu-Gi-Oh. So it's like Yu-Gi-Oh, but with uh, American black culture. But she's trying to say that it is all culture for all black people in the dis diaspora. Because <laughs> basically she's saying everybody shares the exact same culture if they share the same skin tone. Um... <laughs> You find out that her single mod, because she only has one mod for this, is what is is mixed race. <laughs> and her single mod is afraid to tell her that she's mixed race because she feels like she's going to betray the main character and get kicked off the server. Oh my god, it was pain. It was so much pain that you'd think that it was a satire, but it's not. Uh, it was also the author bragged about having writing it in 11 days, and you can tell. <laughs> the next story that was a body and blood and it is about a couple of priests that are fighting demons in this city in order to bring people back from being controlled by demons and it is kind of action i described it as action superhero but like with priests and uh they are a little bit uncouth especially keenan and i put that in you are spared because it is very good for within its genre of what it's trying to do and what it is the next was Let There Be Fire. I'm putting that in Dumpster Fire because it it's about a dark elf named Cal who gets arrested for harassing a female guard in this town that he got to where he meets this guy then in the prison and the guy's name is Avi. And the guy is arrested for murder or assumed murder that he murdered like his wife. And so then Cal agrees to help Avi find his missing son and to defeat the bad guy that murdered his wife because Avi has, cause, uh, cause Cal has such a big heart. Now for me, this book was lacking in the world building it was lacking in the description it didn't feel lived in and it felt like a D, D campaign turned into a book and was never built out for readers who weren't connected to that thing and then you have cripple squadron which was oh my gosh actually you were criminally boring which i'm going to drop into dumpster fire and you're under arrest because it is about this woman named vicky who she is a pilot for the united states government like a space pilot of sorts and she has this chip in her brain that allows her to drive the plane with her brain. So she's the only one that can drive these planes. And so she goes to work this one day where they're supposed to be working on the bugs on this plane. And she gets on the plane and then it like has an issue and she crashes. And pretty much half of her body is destroyed. So she then becomes a cripple. Uh, she's barely a cripple for very long because she then has her body parts replaced with robot parts in a chapter after not being in the book for like a quarter of the book. And then she immediately knows how to use those parts. And uh, it's just ba space battle after space battle after space battle against the Chinese. It is so boring. <laughs> uh, I had wished that it would be at least entertaining, but it wasn't anything. You had Library of the Dead, which was another book that we read for the Loin Stream. And it is about a girl named Ropa who lives in... Bring it there. Lives in the... In Scotland. And um, Scotland that does not feel like Scotland at all. 
and there are children that are missing. She also sees ghosts, talks to ghosts, does jobs for ghosts because they've like promised her money from their living family if they do think if she does things for them. And she discovers the or she gets recruited because her grandma's like, You're such a good person. Don't tell that one ghost you won't go and find her missing son. I know that you're better than that. Rope is not really better than that, but she doesn't want to disappoint her grandma, so she agrees to go and do it. And while hunting down this woman's missing son, she discovers the uh, the milkman, and um, that children are being used to have their youth sucked from them and given to this one TV host. And that plot is literally all over the place. Uh, it goes into what the frick is wrong with you because... Um, why is it set in Scotland and doesn't feel at all like Scotland? Like, all of the re cultural references are also American. But it was written by somebody from Zimbabwe. So, like, I don't really understand the choices in this book. And I almost feel like it was pressure from the publisher and the agent that put it in the UK slash Scotland. Because all of his other books are, like, Zimbabwean. And I don't feel like that was a very good choice to make for Library of the Dead. It was not respectful at all to its location. The next that I read was Dennis Sparrows, which is the second book after Tower of Dogs, and it continues after Tower of Dogs, where you got the continuation of Sparrow being in Edun and Rome being in the forest, but you have them more coming to age of like where they are and who they are and what they're doing. So Rome kind of challenges some of the other guys in the groups and sort of assumes the leadership position that he is going to be in. And he is also bettering his abilities because he's got special abilities. His specifically are turning his skin into metal. And then Sparrow is sort of uncovering what her position is going to be in her relation to the gods and goddesses of that are contacting her in Edon and how she fits with her her friend slash boss slash mistress Jenny as Jenny resumes her independence and starts being able to grow again as a young woman uh, and her disability sort of fades away or she works through her disability and so it's a great continuation it gets more action-packed and I'm looking forward to reading the third book I haven't been able to read the third book this year because you see my TBR it stuff happens the next book that I read was The Second Son by Mike Van Hoos. And uh, where should I put that? You Were Here. Wish You Were Here. That is a book about Laxis, who is sort of a bounty hunter with power. She's got powers given to her by the gods of things because the gods are all born in twos. You got the male version and the female version, and they're like yin and yang for everything. You know, chaos and order, dark and light, blah. And so they're always born as twins. And so Laxis was sent on this job by the Steel Keep, which is the Steel family, belongs to the Steel family. And she is meant to go and get this witch named Wyo, who has been terrorizing their township. But when she brings back the witch named Wyo, turns out that the king is dead. And uh, you got some family dynamics, Game of Thrones style going on, on who is going to run the Steel Keep. And everybody sucks. There, there was a lot of uh, lecherous men and there are powers and abilities abound going around. Also, a centipede's perspective. Uh, then I read Isom by Eric July. Uh, I think that goes in dumpster fire, honestly, because it just it, it doesn't make any sense. So Isom is about a character named Avery who has given up on city life because he is a failed superhero. He retired feels like after his first real job uh and so he's living in the middle of the woods well he's living in the middle of nowhere in his farm just doing his ranch thing when all of a sudden he gets a call from his sister saying hey one of our childhood friends or a friend of somebody that we knew in our childhood is missing can you go and look for her her name, her name is jasmine and last time anybody saw her she was with this guy you went to school with named darren so then he goes into town to go and give darren a visit and ask darren about jasmine and then darren is like don't be asking questions like that. BT dubs, you need a job because I need a janitor. Not those specific words, but basically those words. And so then this turns into the power struggle between Avery and Darren, where Avery is absolutely sure that Darren has Jasmine because basically he told her that he because basically he told him that he has Jasmine anyway. So it's like great job, Mr. Superpower. And it's just the whole thing feels like an ad for a bunch of different stories because every like five or six pages, it switches to a different group of people with no information on any of them. And then guess who we get? Oh, yep. The books that follow after uh, ISOM come out, 
two groups of the characters that were in Isom. So it really feels like a sales pitch and is disrespectful to the characters of the story because it doesn't actually give Avery time to find his feet, to find his story, and to tell his story as a flagship character in that comic. Next story is Mary Sue by George Alexopoulos. Absolutely loved it. Did a recent review and discussion with Monty here on the channel. And that's about a girl named Rosemary, who is the goddaughter, adoptive daughter of Masaka, kind of a uh, eccentric engineer of sorts. And she sort of does private merc work, not merc work, but does private work with her robot suit. And, um... I don't know, she's just really sweet. Like, what? what is there to say? She's at the very beginning of it. She's on a ship attacked by space pirates. She's kind of an awkward, quirky girl that doesn't really fit in and is trying to find her place. And she doesn't, like, even her adoptive godfather doesn't really want her around. And she's eventually sent to this water planet to go and get mermaid saliva, where she also then has to make the decision of who becomes the next leader of this mermaid planet. And whoever she picks is going to determine who all dies on that planet. And she also is trying to find out who her real parents are because her godfather won't talk about them and her godfather used to work with her real parents and she wants to know who they are. So it's a very sweet story. It's only got five issues so far, but I'm hoping for more because George's artwork is gorgeous. His character work is fantastic. And it was just a lovely time. Like at the end of this year with everything that I've read, it was just so refreshing. And it's one of those things that that you know you just want to feel good after you read something and you want to feel like you just splashed cold water in your face and it was nice and that's what that was the next was saint gregory by charles bowen and that is also ironically about a young priest this one is named ambrose he's german and he has come to the new world looking for a, his lost friend who came to the new world some time ago and nobody has heard from him so he ends up going to the small town named saint gregory in wisconsin and there are some weird things happening not only are there weird supernatural like things happening and people dying but the town is very close-lipped about weird things that are happening in that township and so starts his he gets there first and then he's gonna have two friends that come over later to help him investigate what is going on and it becomes sort of a test of faith a a sort of am i worthy enough am i good enough and how do i serve god when i don't fit up to this level of expectation for like who i am and what i am and what i've been trained to do and so it was a really enjoyable experience the way that it was written was great i loved the main character ambrose he was sweet he was strong he was very personable for me and he really like I, I vibed with him a lot, and I'm looking forward to what comes after St. Gregory. The next story was Night Bane by Alex Astor, the follow-up to Light Lark, and I'm dropping that in You Are Spared, because one, I think, Light, I think Night Bane was more fun than Light Lark. Absolutely, I enjoyed it more. Um, and I actually did not hate the twist at the ending. I actually really liked the, the twist at the ending. I do think that it didn't need to be interspersed, the past and the present, the past and the present. I get why it did that. But I think this book really wanted to be about uh, her past and what happened before the centennial. And it should have all just been a prequel book, which you can do a second book as a prequel. That happens a lot more than you might think. Um, but that follows after the ending of Light Lark where she is now living with, <laughs> I'm tempted to say Shia LaBeouf, like just naturally. She's now living with Oro and uh, she's having these visions of Grimm, the Nightshade King, coming and killing a bunch of people in order to take her back. We've also got the intersperse of her relationship with Grimm and how that grew over the year before the centennial and their relationship uh, and their romantic entanglements as they grew. And I think seeing her in that light actually really helped the, change the perspective on Light Lark, the first book, because you got to see just how brutal she was. And it, uh, it kind of repackages what she did to the seamen. I think my biggest disappointment with Night Bane, Bane is it introduced Mont, Monty, is it introduced Cleo and like her son going into, and it introduced her having a son and her being kind of like, you don't know whose side she's on. And the fact that her son's soul is somewhere and there's going to be a portal to somewhere to like get the souls of the lost. 
And you don't really see a whole lot of Cleo in the book, and I wish that you got to see more of Cleo, but there is so much going on. I think there were too many characters in Nightbane, but it was so much more fun, I think, than Lightlark. And it justified some of the things that you saw in Lightlark, which is one of the reasons I like to continue reading a series um, even if I didn't like the first book, because sometimes it can put things in perspective that were in earlier books that maybe didn't make sense, but as the story progresses, oh, that's why you did that, or oh, the character grew from that, so they started out this way on purpose. That's that's why I like it. <laughs> Randomly earlier this month, I read Cartoons in a Suicide Forest. No, go down one. Uh, which is a short story collection of bizarro stories that are absolutely bizarre i don't know how else to describe it you got this chick that's like going into a forest and it's very like hot topic the short story where it's the darkness and the rainbows and she like stumbles upon this cult of girls that are all like worshiping this fat chick that is like excretions all over them and they are like eating it and then she like kills this chick and becomes the new supreme leader. You've got spider orgies inside of a sex doll that was being used to create porno shows. You've got Beauty and the Beast retelling short story where the beauty tries to jump out of a window and kill herself. And then instead she just gets picked up by the beast, brought back to the bedroom and then banged until she dies. You've got a short story about a little mermaid. Like there are some obvious inspirations all throughout this collection. And it is very bizarre and it is also sexual and, um, kind of worrying like you get the psyche valve treatment because i read this book first back in 2018 and then i was looking over old blog posts of mine that talked about this book and i wanted to share it with the chat so i did and uh, i understood that why my blog post in 2018 said i am worried about this author and i think they need a psyche valve because it's uh it's, it's disconcerting uh then i read red water dreams which is the follow-up to let there be fire and i'm putting that in dumpster fire because it had all of the same issues as let there be fire which it was it didn't really define the setting it didn't really define the culture it introduced way too many characters all at once it didn't really introduce you to the characters and i mean even more confusing when you've got like D, &D world and then you've also got persephone and hades and all of these other gods that are not actually part of the universe that are also part of this and it doesn't describe how they make sense in this world where greeks don't exist um and you have a complete personality change on cal the main character where he was cocky and op in the first book in this book he becomes like a little sissy a little pushover the one that everybody mocks but he also adds all of the powers that they all rely on to get them out of trouble the next story is Origin of the Sky by Chelsea Harrington, and that was, if you watched the review for that, I loved it. That's about a mountain and a lake who discover a baby being placed on the icy lake's top during the winter and then abandoned by a human, and the lake doesn't want to just listen to that baby cry and die in the cold, so the mountain informs him that he can actually think about becoming a human and then turn into a human and take care of that baby, but once he does that, he can't go back. And so then the lake becomes a human and the mountain becomes a human with the lake, and the two pick up the baby and take care of the baby and raise the baby together as they also determine to travel the world together. And the story is interspersed, and the book is interspersed with stories and folklore and histories all about the world in which it is built. And like, it's funny to compare it with Red Water Dreams because I read one right after another. And where Red Water Dreams didn't feel like it was a lived in world, the origin of the sky felt like a very complete lived in world with its own parables, with its own history, with its own like thick, juicy life within it. And I loved it so much. It hit. It's got, I'm going to cry about it again. It's got so much beautiful art at the front of each chapter that the author did, that the cover is by the author. I love that style of art that she does. And it's all about how we are created by the stories. You're going to get me. By the stories that we pass on, by people that raise us, by the world that surrounds us. And we pass that on to the next. We create new things on to the next. And it's one of the things that underpins like the reason why I do what I do and I value stories the way that I do. And I just think it is a fantastic piece of literature. And I think it's a work of art in like all of the ways. It like, mm, mm, I can't wait for a physical copy of it. Oh my gosh. Gets me emotional just thinking about it. Probably one of my favorite books at this point. It's just, it's so nice. It's so full of hope. 
And I was so happy to like end the year off with reading that book, you know, and then we get to the disasters that actually added the wish you were here section. One of them, they're both by a YouTuber, the same YouTuber. It's book one and book two review coming soon. I'm waiting on a few things before I can do it, but it'll come in. It'll come later this month. So the first in that duology is Good Angel. I feel like I have to put them both in literal torture device. I read them close enough together. It was basically the same thing. I read them in like four days, um, which is about theoretically an angel. I don't want to call them angels because they don't act like angels. They don't do anything like angels. They're just horny teenagers and Good Angel. Um, about, But it's about an angel named Iofiel who ends up going to a university for angels and demons because heaven and hell are full. And so that's where you send the angels so that they can go and learn in classes because they're also all reincarnates of their last versions. Why would you put angels and demons in the same school and assume that they will not be corrupted by the other? And like Archangel Michael is trying to artificially start the the Armageddon by using Aophiel who is becoming friends with all of the demons and then starts taking demon classes even though nobody stops her and this is supposed to be the thing that's going to help force Armageddon and then all the way at the end of the book Aophiel just Michael knows that she's a bad guy and she he's like I'm going to execute you and then hopefully the next Aophiel will be better than you and then he like flies over to go and like kill her later somewhere else <laughs> i don't know he flies away and she like follows and then she's like standing next to him and she just stabs him and then he dies like this is supposed to be the guy that has never died in th tens of thousands of years he is the only archangel that has never died and this girl who describes her light knife as something that is so flimsy and barely workable it's just like stab and then he's just like <laughs> i just i can't and it's all over the time. It's just, it feels like it was written by a horny 14 year old trying to like having her sexual awakening because Iophiel is naive. But every time sex comes up, she like asks so many questions because she is so curious about sex. And then, and it also obviously hates Christians. It completely just is so disrespectful. Like wait until you see the review for that. The second book in that duology is Bad End. And you could tell that it was written after a period of time, which is also ironic. So one was published in like 2017 and then one was published last year. And you can tell that the author aged between writing them uh, because you have none of the sexual awakening that was in the first, in the second. Um, but you do have like, Lucifer is just a fun guy that is misunderstood and like, and you have demons that are also like, yeah, pronouns don't matter to us. But every time that we introduce ourselves to somebody, we're going to do a pronoun speech and then use these obscure pronouns that nobody uses and explain them and then get mad at you for not knowing them. It was a disaster. Okay, uh, I'm trying to even just remember what it was. Freaking this imp's name was the apple. None of it made any sense. It actually made less sense than the first book. Anyway, stay tuned for the review of that. But they were just so miserable they were not fun they were written out of spite except for good angel also felt like it was written out of spite for christians and religion but also sexual awakening of a teenager so then the last things that i'm going to cover are the video games that i played this year and <laughs> first was yakuza kiwami 1 which i started last year and then continued this year uh you could tell that it is a prototype for sure but it has a lot of fun elements in it i love the fighting style i love the humor obviously i've been having a great time with the y yakuza stuff and i can't wait to write my own japanese inspired story which will be coming eventually then you have kiwami 2 which i think was better than kiwami 1 uh, other than Goda being freaking not given the time of day in his own game, I think that he was cheated. He had such a fun character design and so much presence, but he was hardly in the story. And then he gets suicided at the end. Like, are you kidding me? He, he deserved better than that. But the fighting styles and the upgrade styles were awesome in that. The entry to the building so that you didn't have the loading screen, I loved it. It was so smooth. It brought back the Cabaret Club minigame. I love the Cabaret Club minigame. Kiwami 2 was just, it was peak. Needed more Nishiki in it, though. Then we did Faith, the Unholy Trinity, which is a game about a priest who is going back to, like, take care of an exorcism that he failed at previously. It kind of haunts him. And uh, 
the art style in that is fantastic. The storytelling in that is very interesting. And the more that I learned about it and its development, the more I appreciated the artistry behind what the creator did with that game. The next one is Yakuza 3, which is set mostly in Okinawa with the Okinawa droning. Tell that it was done in 2009 because the controls were kind of janky. The graphics were kind of janky. But it was still, it had its enjoyable moments, but also, I mean, it had Mine and Daigo, which are great, but also, and, you know, Richard, Andre Richardson, which is always funny when Americans show up in the games. That's kind of, it's just how it is. And you had Red Dead Redemption, which is going to be probably my favorite game of the year to play, and it also inspired my Westies that I'm doing with Monty, which I'm so excited to write about. That's going to be the first project next year after I set Body More Zero down. So hopefully that'll be coming soon. And I loved Arthur's character arc. I loved Dutch. He is a great villain. Mike is an asshole. Uh, Charles is wonderful. I loved the teamwork between the sides. And I loved watching the two sides, like the group, sort of split as their ideas and their morals sort of split. And watching Arthur change as a person and just, it was such a magical experience. You got Peanut, you got Almond Joy, you know, just, the memories with that and I'm so happy that I've gotten to share this with everybody this year. The next is Dishonored <laughs> where I am the low chaos queen okay it was good it was a good time. Dishonored is about uh, like a bodyguard whose ward was who's the mother of his ward was attacked the queen whatever the queen the empress whatever was attacked and he is assumed to be the killer and so he has to get to the bottom of it and clear his name and also save back the child that is to become the next ruler and uh, you are an assassin or you know a quiet assassin however you want to play and then the last game that we are currently playing right now which is like a dragon ishin which is yakuza but in the 1868 7 1868 uh with the same characters but different characters and uh, we've got chicken race what can i tell you about that i don't know it's just a good time the gameplay is so smooth the characters are fun ijanaika is there and uh it's just been really really fun so these are the books and the stories that i've consumed this year some great ones some not great ones there are more in that top tier than i was in big sleeve energy than i was expecting i know half of them are games but not so bad we do have a heck of a lot of them and they got torture devices in hell, but you know what? We're not that bad. <laughs> so here's to what's going on next year. I am hopeful. I am looking forward to all the great things that I will be reading, including, you know, Bringer of Light, Amygdala, some llamas with guns, llama with a gun, the cold dish, and so, so much more. I am looking forward to all of the books that I will find this year, the stories I will discover with you guys. And thank you so much for hanging out with me whenever you do. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Have you read any of these books? Will you read any of these books? Good luck if you read the Torture Device segment. That said, thank you so much. Have a great weekend and don't die. Was that Wayland Cross in the trunk? Do you know, or is that something that's still being figured out? The person in the trunk was not Wayland Cross. Is he in trouble? We don't know who did it, but as the owner of the car, the longer he's missing, the worse it looks for him. Cross isn't a killer. For the last couple of years, the average number of murders in Baltimore has been over 300, and it's been going up. Mind you, that's only whatever the badges count as official murder, and believe me, there are people that don't count when they die. Wayland? If you're down here, tell me. I'm not talking to the badges, I just... I've been looking for you. They found a body in your trunk, Way. Why? Did you do that? To the left. Plain black letters read along the wall. You walked in the corridor. Once that ends, you chose the dark is on the right. My vision goes blurry, flickers black and black and black for longer intervals until I can't see anything at all. I'm not screaming anymore, but my voice echoes back to me. Where the hell am I? You're dead, Josephine. 
Even smart people do stupid shit sometimes, right? <laughs>